Hi, I've written an eight bar melody in the key of F minor, and we're going to have a little think about what we could do in terms of harmonizing this melody, turning it into something that's a piece, not just a melodic line. But let's start by listening to the melody. So here we are in F minor, um, a phrase that starts on the tonic, kind of goes to an E natural, the leading note, so that's suggesting some kind of imperfect cadence, comes back to the tonic, starts in the same way as the first phrase, goes in a slightly different direction, and finishes on what's likely to be a perfect cadence in F minor. This is how it goes. Okay, let's consider some options for how we might harmonize something like this. It's a question that lots of people ask us. They say, oh, I've written this great melody, but I don't know really what to do with it. Or I don't know how to write something in different kinds of styles. Well, let's start by thinking maybe in something that's akin to a Baroque style, maybe working in two parts. Well, there's quite a lot of Baroque keyboard music that's written in two parts, <clears throat> and quite often there's an element of imitation or counterpoint about it, but not always, because quite a lot of Baroque things have a sort of stronger melody in the right hand, with the left hand providing some kind of bass line. So we could get straight away involved in two parts from the opening, or we could decide, for example, that these first few notes are a little musical idea that could be imitated. For example, how about this? So do you see what I did there? I imitated these first four notes, but starting here, not on F, but on C. So I put this as a dominant chord here. Why did I do that? Well, when you look at this first bar, that implies a chord one in F minor. When you look at the second bar, that implies a chord five, possibly going to a five seven in F minor. So if I were to use this at the same pitch in this bar, it wouldn't work so well because I'd have a sort of conflict of interest. So in other words, let me do it so that I play this and then I imitate this at the same pitch, maybe an octave lower in the next bar. Now, it, it doesn't sound terrible, it works, doesn't it? But can you hear there's a slight conflict of interest because that's outlining a movement to chord five, really, and I'm playing notes that belong to chord one. They fit, I've designed it so it would fit, but if we take this figure and transpose it to the fifth, so that we start on C and then we go E natural back to C, then we can put this under here so it imitates this figure, but still fits with the harmony of that bar. Let's just do that again. And you can do this in the upper octave or the lower octave, whichever you like. I did it in the upper octave last time. I'll do it in the lower octave this time. Do you see how that works? works much more effectively, doesn't it, than doing it at the same pitch, and it's already sounding a bit Baroque. Having imitated that, well, this melody then kind of goes off in its own direction, so I'm not going to be able to keep this imitation going. So always worth when you're wanting to write in that sort of Baroque style, or even if you're not wanting to write in Baroque style, but you're wanting to be a bit more imitative, thinking, what is the idea that I can imitate? How far can I go? Now, if I look at this first phrase, you could say it's got a head and a tail. Here's the head. And here's the tail. So it may be that I can imitate the head, but the tail isn't really going to lend itself to imitation in quite the same way. So having done this imitation around the dominant chord, I could then move off in a less imitative way. So do you see then, all I've done there is to work 
the harmony. And it works quite nicely that the bass can climb up a scale there, doesn't it? You see how I did that? So in this bar, the bass went F, G, A flat, B flat, C. Now that's outlining sensible harmony, isn't it? Kind of one, five C, one B. That's a passing six four that we're thinking about there, isn't there? One, five C, one B. Now we've got to think cadence. So I'm sort of thinking, well, let's go two five, but two B is even better in a minor key because of the nature of chord two as a diminished chord. And then I'm getting to a chord five. Now, if I'm in a Baroque style, that's working quite well, isn't it? You may want to vary the rhythm a little bit there, I don't know. Would give you a little bit of variety, wouldn't it? So you could just get a bit of rhythmic independence there. If you're in a Baroque style and wanting to have this sort of feeling of two independent lines, this long note is a little bit of a gift as well, isn't it? Because what you don't want to do is just sit on that note. Having done what we've just done, be a bit of the kiss of death wouldn't it just to sit there so could the lower part now get moving while the upper part is kind of settling on that note well we've got to think about the fact we're going on to something else that looks like a chord one so one two three four one do you see what I've done there having some quavers in the lower part so I've gone for a crotchet C there and then quavers that go C D flat C B flat a flat G that lead me on to the next one. How have I done that? This is all a chord five, so C is part of the harmony. Then D, if I go from C and I repeat the C, that's all harmony. D flat's an upper auxiliary, back to C, which is harmony. B flat is passing, but it's also actually helping to suggest a five seven, but it's an unaccented passing. The A flat is an accented passing going on to G, which is harmony. So remember that thing about you can have an unaccented passing note followed by an accented passing note onto the harmony, but it gives it character, doesn't it? And you see that sort of Baroque sound of that. So what have we got so far? Of independence going on between. Now you might then think oh well we imitated the head there let's imitate the head there. You probably could do in some way. It might be a little bit predictable to do that so maybe having imitated that one you don't imitate this one but maybe trying to keep a little bit of rhythmic independence so rather than have sort of something like which would be a little bit sort of samey between the hands, wouldn't it? So if I started on an A flat in the left hand, I might be able to move down to an F on the second crotchet. So we get a little bit of independence there. Do you see what I've done there? Do you see how that gives us a bit of counterpoint between the two parts, doesn't it? And then I'm sitting down here. So could this be a moment where the lower part moves? So. Do you get the idea? That would give us a possible harmonization of that where I'm actually still thinking about harmony. So don't think about counterpoint at the expense of harmony. Think what you're doing with the harmony. But I'm trying to write a second part that's a bit independent of that. That sounds quite baroque -y. So that would be Baroque style, two-part texture, little bit of imitation, bit of counterpoint going there. But of course, there are other things we could do with this. We could see this as a melody, couldn't we, with some kind of accompanying figure underneath, like this. be a totally different impact, wouldn't it? It would feel totally different in style. 
it's sort of got some classical features, doesn't it? Melody and accompaniment. Uh, the idea of these kind of repeated notes in the accompaniment, but it sort of feels a bit more if it's got a romantic leaning in terms of its general expression. So you could do that, just have an accompaniment that's kind of that kind of stuff. So th again, you think the harmony first, get the harmony in your mind so you know where you're going. I purposely use some slightly different harmony there so that you can do something with that. You could create a very different effect in terms of speed. We don't have to have a busy accompaniment there, do we? I could have something that's a bit slower, a bit more sedate, but maybe with some richer chords in it. So for example, a bit more somber in mood, isn't it? And it's more romantic in its expression where I'm trying to use a few more imaginative chords there. So thinking about where your chromatic chords might come, but a much more sedate idea in the accompanying figure. You could do something that's more modern in style, couldn't you? Like uh, take something that's a little bit neoclassical. So take the Baroque idea that we had of a bit of imitation, a bit of two part, whatever, but to treat it in a slightly kind of quirky style in terms of its harmony, you know, to do something less solidly conventional in terms of the harmony. How about something like this? It's sort of not wildly dissonant, is it? But it's just doing something slightly quirky. I was just experimenting with ideas here. So just a little thought on how do we take a melody? How do we have different kind of textures? How do we take a different stylistic view? Do we want to do something that's more Baroque in terms of two parts, imitation, right hand on a melody, left hand on a bass? Do we want to do something that's more classical, romantic in terms of melody with accompanying ideas, but how far do we go with the harmony? How far do we go with the thickness of texture? What could we do with speed? What could we do with dynamics to make that a different kind of approach? How could we do something that's maybe a little bit more quirky? You could even do that in a sort of completely bitonal way, couldn't you, if you want to do something more modern? <laughs> possibilities are endless. But it's about opening the musical imagination to all these kind of possibilities. Anyway, I hope that's given you a few thoughts for dealing with a melody that you might have in various different ways.